chair up here before I start talking. So there's a chair just here now as well if anybody fancies coming up and sitting at the front. Um, so just a little tiny preamble for Wes. Um, you told me about seven, eight years ago, I think. Was it really? Yeah, yeah, it was a long seven, seven years ago. So Wes work is incredible, um, works into kind of like a very, very cynical but quite funny view on smart objects, which I really, really enjoy. I don't know if that's going to go into the talking today because this is mostly on AI and labor, but uh, Wes's recent exhibition at the Science Museum was uh, with 200 uh, Alexas, Amazon Alexas. 200 smart devices. Smart yeah. devices, yeah, yeah. 200 smart devices all uh, explaining how they've kind of been g given up on and how they were objects of the past. So, um, yeah, there's sort of like a little a bit of a humor essential to a lot of the kind of uh, work that you do, which I've always quite admired. So, um, yeah, introducing Wesley Gurley for uh, this talk on demanding no automation. Thank you. Thank you. We good sound wise at the back? Great. Um, thanks, really nice to be here, um, lovely to see um, Marissa's work, that was super interesting, and me as a data nerd, I'm fully on board, um, and uh, nice to see friends and, and colleagues here as well. Um, so I'm going to do a talk today called Demand No Automation to Towards a Progressive AIR, I'm going to unpack a bunch of this as I go. Um, but uh, just a bit of a preamble first about me. So I'm um, an artist and a researcher and an educator based here in London. Um, and I've been working in installation sound art performance for some time. I have a background as a, a, um, a performance artist for a long time before that as well. And um, I have a, a PhD in uh, data aesthetics and the philosophy of art. So this brings me into the context of why I'm interested in the stuff I'm talking about today and um, why I think it's worth talking about. So my work in relation to um, AI tools, I'm gonna stop doing that now, but whenever I say AI, please do this in your heads for me, that'd be great. Um, my work of AI tools uh, started in 2017 with Dark Age Connectionism, which was a work that was looking at the sort of obscured surveillance politics behind um, devices like smart speakers, um, and then works like Echo Rain, which was looking at the intimate relationship between Amazon next door um, and the military industrial complex and how those tools get weaponized into uh, things that kill people. Um, and uh, works like Chthonic Rights from 2020, which was looking at the sort of strange histories of cults in relation to um, smart technologies uh, and things like newly forgotten technologies, which is a series of works, one of which was just uh, in the Science Gallery London's um, most recent AI show uh, about the, the sort of deep history that will come um, after the current era of smart technologies are thrown away because these things break down at a very slow pace. And it's also was a piece about talking about the many possible futures we can look towards other than the two we normally have, which is shiny AI um, uh, future or the climate crisis, and that's it. Um, but those two are definitely you know, important ones to think about as well. So whenever I give any talk about AI, which I do a lot these days, I always like to preface by saying artificial intelligence does not exist. It's a speculative sci-fi thing. Um, what we have now is better and generally referred to as narrow AI, um, but uh, it isn't AI and it's arguably not, uh, not any closer to AI than this laptop is. Um, and here's some definitions between uh, the difference between what we have and what this kind of speculative, mythical, um, sci-fi um, uh, idea of artificial intelligence would be. I personally am in the, the camp that says we don't know what intelligence is, how on earth could we possibly make a, 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 a second one. Um, we've only got one way of making intelligences so far and that's enough, we've made enough of those. Um, uh, and so an important thing to carry all the way through this talk, which I'm gonna try to keep 30 minutes as promised, um, is that um, AI is not a technology um, uh, it's a brand because it doesn't exist you know AI doesn't exist but there's things that are called AI used to sell stuff like all brands it isn't a thing you know coke isn't a thing coke's a name you put on a can of pop to sell it right 
Um, it's an idea used to sell things. And I'm gonna come back to that like at multiple points in this, but it's just good to have that as a kind of the, the preface for what's gonna come. So I've called this like towards a progressive AIR, and I'm being sort of picky about that, that word um, because uh, there's a misconception, I think, largely about that progress means faster computers kind of everywhere, where, where I think that we should think about progress very differently, particularly in relation to technologies and in relation to art. As an artist who works a lot of technology for a long time, I feel very invested in that. And I'm talking specifically about art practice today and creative practice more broadly with these sorts of tools and technologies. Um, and I'm going to be talking about regressive versus progressive. So regressive sort of meaning like things that really feel like they echo stuff from the past we should leave behind in the past and progressive meaning things that I want to see more of in the future. I'm actually going to be talking about a lot of things that are actually already here and are being done. So this isn't like a super speculative thing. I'm just saying I think we should want and have more of this is sort of my angle here. So the first kind of regressive thing I want to talk about is this idea that our art is a tech demo for algorithmic capitalism. This is a, something that I want us to sort of leave behind. Um, and when I say that, I mean that there are, there's a whole, it's been going on for a long time realistically, but a range of practices out in the world that really feel like they're doing sort of like tech demos or demonstration of, of technologies for tech companies, and that's largely its kind of contribution culturally is what it's, it's kind of doing that, like the artistic value seems to be obscured by the, the demonstration of a tool. Um, we see this a lot in the I asked AI to trend, which obviously you've probably have all got if you've got a phone, um, you've probably seen this phrase, I asked AI to draw me pictures of Harry Potter characters as if they're queuing up for Berghain or whatever, you know. And, and this is what it created. It's always, I asked AI to blah, 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 and this is what it created, right? It's very, very common. Everywhere you, you want to look for images or this sort of thing, it, it's out there. Um, the, the search term for that came up with two and a half billion results last time I checked. Um, and, and I've got issues with this framing, you know, for, because it's, cause it's, so, it's so populous, you know, and these are the reasons why these things are worth pointing your finger at and going, no, no more of this, please. Um, because it is very widespread and, and uh, therefore can be said to have a, a big impact on culture. So uh, the reason why I've got kind of ire with this framing is that it does a couple of things. I mean, one, it totally sublimates the human, right? I asked AI to create this and it created it. It sort of um, abstracts away the act of creativity to a kind of like a monolithic AI. But it also implies this very like seamless interaction that like all you need to do is like ask the AI to give you art and it gives you art and that's what these things do, you know. So that sort of seamlessness, the obscuration of the human and the fact that it kind of depresses creativity below a demonstration of what the tool was made to do, because the tool was made to do that thing of like put in a text prompt and generate stuff. At least tools not as cleverly designed as Marissa's at least. Um, and it finds its mirror in the design of the tools themselves. So if you look at the platform of DALI, um, OpenAI's you know, very dominant um, platform in this space, there are no um, things to adjust. You know, there's no preferences. You've just got a text box, and then you've got some examples of stuff that's been done before. You know, you can't look at the database. You can't experiment with the database. You can't tweak the algorithm. You can't even see how, who or what the, the algorithm was written by and what it is, how it functions, what methods it uses, you know, where that database came from. More on that later. Um, uh, and also, and the, these are all obscure things, you know, through the design of this platform. That's not an accident, obviously. Um, but also, that's worth challenging, given that you know, this is a classic black box. This is a good Tobias Revel image that I found <coughs> on the internet accidentally. Uh, he's not here, that's good. You would make fun of me for it. Um, but the, um, the black box, you know, putting an input in, mystery things happen, in, output comes out, you know, that's loads of technologies we already have and there's a lots of critiques of those technologies around is why these sorts of diagrams exist. Um, and one of the things that it um, obscures as part of that is the very nested human politics of those tools. For example, um, all of those major players in the generative AI space as so currently constructed um, are, pretty much all of them are currently under various forms of litigation 
for the fact that the tools have been built on a massive amount of purloined, stolen images from around the internet that are the creative labor of potentially millions of, of, of unattributed creative practitioners. You know, they just hoovered up everything that was put online um, and then trained their tool on that data set. So that's clearly got a, a, um, you know, a, an impact on, uh, the, the, on creativity and the value and respect that is given to the work of other people because also they're at the, at the same time campaigning to be made exempt from copyright so they can keep making money. That's basically their argument. We should be exempt from copyright because we want to make more money. Um, at the same time, like, going a deeper layer down into like, these tools and what's hidden in that structure, it's things like this, you know, OpenAI, who make ChatGPT and DALI, um, uh, use companies like Samasource in uh, Kenya. Also, a massive um, person who uses Samasource is Meta across the road. Anybody from Meta here? No? Good. Um, so, um, so the, the, it's that, that's a joke. And I'm sure there's people who are Meta, from Meta who are nice. I know some people from DeepMind, they're, they're fine, they're nice people. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just being a sod. But, um, but so Meta also uses this company, and uh, what Sama Source do, they're now called Sama, um, they pay people less than $2 an hour, which is not a bad wage actually in Kenya, to be fair, but it is still less than $2 an hour, to basically view the worst content on the internet, to make sure that it doesn't make it into DALI or ChatGPT or, ETH or any of the Meta tools, which means you are paid as one of these um, workers to view the worst things on the internet that people on Reddit, on 4chan, on every other platform put on there. And so it's an extremely traumatic job. They have teams of psychologists on board. Uh, PTSD is one of the consequences of doing this job. And these are the hidden labors behind this kind of like polished, seamless, you know, you just ask the AI to create a thing and it does this um, uh, system that, that is built there. And so when people frame their work as, you know, possibly two and a half billion people have, um, that there is this narrative of this is just a seamless tool, this is just, I asked a friendly AI, the friendly AI did this. You're really doing um, just tech demo work for those companies, you know, and a tech demo, tech demos occur in, in spaces like this. This is like a, a, a technology expo where uh, companies show their products and people demonstrate them to try to sell them to people. You know, they demonstrate this idealized view of it. It's nothing to do with really how it's gonna be used out in the world. And we don't want to have our creative labor just end up being promotional tools for these sorts of people. But I think when you sublimate your creativity entirely, and even yourself, by hiding behind this myth of the machine did it, that is exactly what you're doing. You're promoting that tool over even yourself. This is like deeper issues kind of politically. You know, something that happened very recently was that OpenAI used to have a clause, sort of like how Google used to say, don't be evil was part of their mantra. They got rid of that at some point. 2012 or something, um, but they had a clause in their terms and conditions that said that OpenAI will never use their tools for military purposes. A few days ago, they deleted that clause, and then the next day, they announced their um, uh, upcoming partnership with the US military to generate, to use ChatGPT in military contexts. So these are really companies that we should not be doing labor for in any way. We cannot trust these people. Um, uh, and yet they, you know, that particular company has this incredibly oversized and dominant impact on the kind of cultural imagination of these tools, but also that market. So what I think is a progressive response to this is instead to frame our art as art that targets and exposes algorithmic capitalism. So I'm going to show one piece of work um, right now um, by the artist um, Tingyi Ren. So Tingyi made this great um, performance piece called See My Gender. So what they're doing is that they're sat in front of a webcam with Amazon recognition, which is Amazon's sort of flagship image recognition system. Uh, the one of the things it's trained to do is to look at a face if it's human and assign a gender to it. There's only two genders in Amazon's world. It's next door. Um, and that's male and female. Um, and uh, they assign a value of how certain the system is that the person in front of it is either one of these only two genders. Um, Ching is a non-binary artist and they wanted to expose both the kind of uh, the, the presumptions about gender that's inherent to those things but also expose the frictions and the breakages in those systems. So what they're doing is sticking and manipulating their face in different ways, sticking bits and pieces over their face, 
in this attempt to get the system to register them as both being 99% male at one point and 99% female, as in 99% certain. 99% certain that they're a female at the other end. What's lovely about this piece, and was very generous um, for Jingyi as a performer, is again, as a non-binary person, um, they're performing uh, some gender roles that they are very uncomfortable with doing, and at various points you can really feel in the, the, the film the discomfort that Jingyi has with this process, um, which both then exposes the tool and the limits of the tool, exposes the, the biases inherent to that, both societal and at a technical level, but also centers Qingyi as the performer and their experience as the thing that we're watching and we care about. You know, there's so many ways to do this within these sorts of practices. We don't need to hide behind the myth of the monolithic AI idea. So similarly, the second point I want to raise, and the thing that I'm like, there's a lot of this, we need to do less of this, is, and I put it in quotes because a lot of people say this, the machine is either thinking, learning, knowing, dreaming, pissing, sleeping, whatever, and making art. So this comes up a lot. One of the arch um, culprits for this is um, Aidan Meller, who made a device along with a largely uncredited team uh, called Ada. His name's Aidan. Uh, he made a thing called uh, Ada, which he put a wig on and a dress on, and he used his female pronouns to describe it. Um, and it's a, a, a drawing plotter arm, which many of you may have seen before, um, and a, a speaker in, in the head of the mannequin, um, which in Aiden's words, Aiden's words, um, is uh, both mind-blowing and groundbreaking stuff. Um, and obviously there's a lot of very old things about patriarchy here, it's not very groundbreaking realistically. But I mean, many people in this field have pointed out a number of times that um, you know this is just a simulacra uh, dressed up uh, with some very quite old technology, and actually there's nothing really novel about this. Only the way that it's being kind of sold and framed as quote unquote the world's first ultra realistic robot artist um, or whatever. Um, so you know that's an example of a kind of actually a, quite a boring technology that's being dressed up with this myth of sort of intelligence or self awareness or identity. Um, similarly, the work of Rafik Anadol often leans towards, uh, you know, he, he uses phrases for this work, like the machine is thinking, it's unconscious, it's dreaming, these, you know, he uses these consistently, or he has done for a little while now, use these consistently to describe um, his projections. Um, and he's constantly kind of like uh, framing um, what is largely just, you know, a, a lava lamp and a big projection. Um, that's a quite a very abstract representation of what's being represented. You know, I, I feel that he sells this through the idea that this thing is like the unconscious dreams of the machine, because he clearly is very interested in, in framing it that way, um, while also you know running quite probably quite large computing stacks and massive projections, and then doing a lot of art about nature, which for me is a cognitive dissonance that would stop me from sleeping at night. But uh, that's not you know I'm not him. Um, but apologies to Rebecca's friends. Um, so uh, to go back to this slide again, AI is not a technology, it's a brand, it's used to sell things. And I would say in both those examples, it's works that are being specifically sold around a certain myth that is a, just a myth and to put it another way is a lie. And this lie is not an innocent one because it is deployed elsewhere and it reinforces other lies. Um, you know, the, the idea that a kind of a, a, a machine can be intelligent and make decisions as both uh, Refik and Aiden um, does about their work is used in things like systems used around the world to, dis to make decisions autonomously um, about whether or not you're going to commit a crime in the future or where in the city those crimes are going to happen um, in, through predictive policing systems such as this. Um, it's my favorite slide whenever talking about predictive policing. This is a quote from the professor who made the data set that this system is built on from Palantir, which you can see more of in Joe's work over there. Um, he says that trying to predict who is going to do what based on last year's data is just horseshit. Good, hard, scientific interventions, what we like to see. Um, but you know, this notion that, um, or this kind of selling technique of saying that your tool or your thing you're trying to sell is beyond human, is intelligent, is smart, is thinking, dreaming, knowing, etc., is very prevalent on a lot of things that are trying to be sold to a lot of people. But again, I mean, there's some real violence attached to this. Um, and when it gets to the point where companies who sell their, their quote, quote unquote autonomous driving you know, vehicles 
um, as saying these are like smart, intelligent systems that make decisions, etc., etc. However, based on the racial biases inherent to those systems, where to, to simplify this down, there's um, largely just white bodies in the data set and no one else. Um, that these vehicles are then being produced that literally do not see black people as humans on the road. Right, so this is where you can find so many examples. I just picked the first one that came to my mind. Um, a lot, if you want to read more about these politics, Maya Andira Ganesh is a great PhD that's just come out about this and a number of other things related to it. Um, so, you know, those things, those, those myths that get reinforced by those practices need to be moved apart because they, they amplify much bigger, more dangerous myths. We should not be amplifying those myths. Those are like the worst misuses of technology within techno capitalism today, arguably, and those frameworks do amplify it and there's no escaping it. A progressive response to this, I would say, the progress that I want to see is that rather than saying that the machine is doing these things, that you centre that a person is thinking, learning, knowing, dreaming, and making art with these tools. I think a great example of this is the work of Su Gwen Chung. Uh, you know, the Drawing Operations Project, which some of you might be familiar with, um, is a great example. So within this, uh, Su Gwen uh, made a, a custom data set of about the last 30 years of their own creative practice of drawing. They fed that data set into a machine learning system that has a robot arm as the output uh, with a, a paintbrush mounted on it. And in effect, the robot is sort of drawing a sort of a style transfer, sort of collage-y uh, combination of all of those images in its data set, which is Su Gwen's own historical creative practice. And then Su Gwen um, draws you know, as, as that process is going on. So sort of responding and, and just drawing and just sat there while that's going on. So Su Gwen is the first person to say, no, the robot's not an artist, in the same way that the paintbrush isn't the artist. The robot is not an artist. You know, the system was trained by Su Gwen, they built it, you know, and it's their practice that, that is the, the core of it. What Su Gwen always says is that these things are tools for creative work and they're really interested in what these tools can do. And in, in, in this instance, it's a really interesting example of using these technologies to make your own creative practice, this kind of like reactive thing that's live in the room with you, the history of that, that's new, you know, and, that, and it's super interesting. And you don't need to pretend that the robot arm is dreaming in order to make that uh, like an interesting thing. So the last point that I wanna get to is um, the notion that convenience is worth the price, even if we are not told the price until it's too late. This is the last kind of like regressive thing for this talk, I've got some lists of other stuff for later if anybody wants to talk about it. Um, but these are like the big three that I see a lot of um, that I want to talk about. And this really comes from the era that all of us here, I'm looking to check there's no four year olds in the room. No, okay, good. All of us here have lived through, which is, you know, the era of social media that's started arguably about mid, mid 2000s was a process where we. Um, signed up for things that we were told were free, but they were not. You know, the outcome was that we were not the customer, we were the product. That we ended up, uh, everything we uploaded, all the opinions we gave, all the friends we connected with, etc., all became forms of data that were then sold to other people to sell us things or make decisions about us, like which way we're going to vote, whether or not you're going to make it through a border of a country, uh, whether or not you're going to get a loan, etc., uh, etc. Et so that was this moment where we, uh, unfortunately, a lot of us, me included, gave away, uh, paid a price that we didn't realize we were gonna pay until too late. Now, an issue I see is that we're seeing a great mirror with the age of, of generative AI art specifically, particularly around as it's constructed by these like, large dominant platforms by dominant operators. I'm not like tarring the entire technique of generative art. Um, because that would be absurd, and you know, Marissa just gave a good example of why, how you can do that without, you know, sort of engaging in these politics. Um, but it's that these dominant platforms are doing this sort of inescapably, and it's sort of their business model, you know, which is to build something where, as I've already mentioned, there's a lot of labour of various types that is obscured. It's and it's promoting um, a narrative of uh, automation that comes through that. And that even as we use this platform, there's this other set of, of kind of uh, unpaid labor that we're doing. Because things like if you put in a prompt, 
and then you go back and tweak that prompt by like a couple of words. It's implied then, at a, an algorithmic level, it can be inferred that the first prompt didn't quite give you what you wanted. You know, there's a, a very clear, obvious behavioral mappings you can do there that's not sophisticated. But those are like little bits of data that you give that platform, um, as well as like what, uh, what things you decide to like right click on to export, um, any other buttons you press on that site, you know, and even like mouse tracking, obviously, it's been done for a long time, pioneered by our friends over the road there. Um, and those are all forms of unpaid labor which go into refining that system further to improve its capacities to do things like threat and labor amongst many others. You know, this is an old history that we've seen again and again with automation tools. Uh, there's a book called The Myth of Autonomy. I can't remember who wrote it now, uh, but it's quite good. It came out, only came out a couple of years ago. Um, but th th that goes into great detail about this sort of thing. But um, the Jacquard Loom is a good example where the history of automation shows that automated technologies don't magically replace um, all labor. They kind of change what that job is um, to get it to the point where you need less specialized skills to do it and typically you are paid less. Uh, and often the labor is of a poorer quality um, through the machine. You know, a good example of this that we see in generative AI is how, you know, the arguably unfixable problem of quote-unquote hallucination, bad words that, you, that people shouldn't use, always do quote-unquote hallucination, um, that the errors that are inherent to actually kind of like this entire age of AI that we live in, arguably, um, about the kind of real world problem of that these systems aren't actually alive, they don't know what a hand is, they know what some pixels are and a symbol attached to it, but that's it. Um, means you get stuff like this where famously generative AI systems produce hands with six fingers and three legs even though like a four-year-old would conceivably not do that or recognize that being wrong. And so uh, often when you use these platforms your job becomes editing those images and getting rid of the finger, right? And, and if you are in one of those jobs where they stopped paying an illustrator and start asking you instead to do prompt images, your labor then becomes, rather than generating uh, pictures from scratch, you just edit the bad faults in a very repetitive way of those systems. So in this way, automation does not free us. It turns us into machines for fixing machines. And we see this in the, auto the history of automation again and again. And we will see more of this in our jobs in the next five years and for as long as there are jobs that involve computers, arguably, until this paradigm shifts. Because um, you know, the UK government, for example, uh, we were talking about earlier, sees automation um, as a solution to uh, funding. You know, because it makes things cheaper, because you pay less people, but you, make, you give them worse jobs, and the labor becomes worse and more dehumanizing. So there's this whole you know, sort of fairly depressing thing where we don't really have, the, you know, the robot future isn't here, um, but we have become robots in its place. Um, and we want to move away from that, especially us in the creative industries, we really want to move away from that. So AI art has become a little bit of a genre, right? You can kind of spot things a bit AIE, right? It's already become a bit boring, which is good, because boring things lose some of their power, and that's useful for, for me in this perspective. Um, but there's something else that's, that's inherently, I think, boring to this field, and there's another reason why we should be moving away from it. Um, and it's the images like this, you know, that, which are generated through these sorts of platforms. You know, a successful outcome is the one that looks like a human did it. I.e., it looks like something you've seen before. It looks like you can imagine, yeah, that looks like stuff I've seen before. I mean, it always looks like video game characters and um, things that have got references to a copyrighted IP somewhere, right? Surprise, surprise, given the, the, the construction of the um, data sets. But there's something um, that I think it's like discreative platform. It's a discreative platform. It's the opposite of creativity, given that um, these systems are entirely bound to only produce, in effect, kind of um, a slightly sophisticated collage of what's come before. Now, like humans, we when we make art, we're perhaps inspired by the stuff we've come before, but we're not bound to it. You know, it doesn't literally, uh, it doesn't function as a cage that we can't escape in our creative endeavors. And in fact, the best things is when, when we erupt out of that space and make something genuinely novel and new. But these are systems that are genuinely, at structural level, incapable of doing that. They can put novel combinations of stuff together, but will never produce something that does not already, in some sense, exist probably at scale within their data set. That's why I would argue these are discreative tools and we should not be using them. 
We should not be trusting our creative labor to companies we cannot trust, because, you know, again, DALI, a, a dominant platform in this space that possibly all three of these images came from, um, now make military tools. Um, uh, OpenAI do, rather, their, their parent company. Which is why I say, you know, with full force and enthusiasm, there is no future for us as creative practitioners in anything that companies like OpenAI say, do, or make. They're not our friends. We should not be lending them creative labor. And we have a choice in this. This is our choice to do so. You know, the, the only thing that we're, that we're getting through that process is convenience because the algorithms and the capacity to make our own data sets, et cetera, are available in loads of places for free. And there's loads of like free guides on YouTube and Stack Overflow exists. And thankfully they've banned generative AI to, from generating answers. So they're still a useful platform. You know, and even Reddit still exists, God bless it, you know. Um, because, you know, and some people when I talk about this, and I'm like, look, basically what we need to do is start deploying our own algorithms and databases more and do it locally on your own computer or with a distributed setup like Marissa was talking about to achieve, you know, the amazing stuff that she was doing. Um, and people say, yeah, but where's, I don't have the time to do that. I mean, it seems really complicated and, you know, and I just don't have the time. To which I always say, look, I appreciate that argument, however, the work of art has always been you continually learning the tool that you're using, whatever it is, until the moment that you die. And at that moment, you are still learning how to do it. Because we as artists bring our lived experience to our practice, right? And it changes as our lived experience changes. As our fucking brain chemistry changes, our relationship to our tools change. Which means you have never mastered it. The tool is never done. So there is no, in that sense, there is no more complicated or less complicated artistic tools. They are all incredibly complicated. It's just whether or not you particularly want to use that tool. If you don't particularly want to use that tool, don't use a different one. But don't think that it's like necessarily more complicated. You know, allow yourself to be challenged by that and realize that all art is a challenge and all art is a process of learning. And recognize that Stack Overflow is very good and there's a lot of like free YouTube videos to do this stuff. You know, I never did computer science. I, I find this stuff difficult for sure. I feel stupid like most of us do when we code. We feel stupid until we solve that one problem. We feel like a genius for a second, then we go back to feeling stupid again. But like it's totally possible. Um, and so like, you know, the kind of progressive, and I'm, I'm slightly over, I'm in like three more minutes, okay. Um, I don't like being over, it's very unfriendly to go over. Um, so um, the, the kind of progressive response, I wanna say this, and this is a slightly tongue in cheek thing, partially because I know Joe, Joe was gonna be here and he'd like this. Um, is that, you know, the artists control the means of production. By that I mean that, like, it is entirely possible for us to frame these practices, frankly, much like Sugwen does in their practice, um, as ways for us to, like, move away from these sorts of platforms that seem enticing because of what they promise, but we've got a lot of reasons not to accept that convenience. Um, I'll be slightly indulgent and show my own work um, with, along with Charlie Peters and Tobias Revel here, only because I get to talk about that the decisions behind making the work that are useful here. So this was a project called Charismatic Mega Pigment we made in 2018. Um, in this work, Charlie, who's a, an abstract or formalist painter, so she doesn't see or, or, or see meaning in what she does. So the, she painted this green picture, so to her has no meaning. Um, me and Tobias are conceptual artists, so we think that's insane. But you know, it's Charlie's practice, we respect it. Uh, Tobias built this kind of robotic pulley system where a webcam with a tablet computer um, mounted on it is being pulled across um, the, the canvas and is showing these intimate views through the webcam of the detail of the, the, the brush strokes and, and the shapes on Charlie's painting. So it's feeding um, a machine learning system that I built and uh, was the first one I'd ever done and um, with a custom data set of 30,000 images. And what it does is it tries to find an aesthetic match between what's in front of the webcam and what's in the database. Pretty simple, it's a K and N network for you know, the, the, the nerds in the room. Um, so, so simple stuff in terms of machine learning. It's been around 20 years, probably more. Um, so, and loads of easy guides to how to do this sort of thing, right? And it's all free. Uh, so the, what was interesting here was that I got to like play around with different algorithms to find which one to understand what a K and N network was for one thing, because um, I didn't know that because I'm not a computer scientist. And um, but I was interested. I knew it could do this sort of stuff, and so I knew I should be able to find out somehow. So I did. Um, and then also I built this database of 30,000 images, which was one of the kind of key aspects of the work because what I did is I pulled every image on Google Image Search. It was labeled green by Google's own. 
um, image labeling system. Um, and what that revealed is, is that the, the color green is a super, has a very, very political life right now. It's, a, you know, there is no neutral color. Even the color neutral is racist, so it's not neutral. Um, uh, but this, but green is a particularly contentious color in the 21st century. Um, and that's because so many of these images, when you watch this work kind of function, so many of the images that would get picked up by these abstract patterns were things like rainforest deforestation, Extinction Rebellion protests, it was, um, you know, uh, eco and sustainable products sold by like Nike and things like that. Um, or uh, politicians stood in front of big green banners advertising the green thing they're doing. Um, so, including Labour, who just cut all of their uh, green funding out of their, um, out of their campaign promises. Uh, or at least the 28 billion package. Um, so, um, I mean, still vote Labour, everybody. We've got a job to do, but, you know, just, they're, they're not off the hook. Um, but the, um, so what was interesting about this was watching people watch that, because it was both a sort of a demonstration of how we can use these tools to reflect back interesting things and to find meaning maybe in the abstract, um, but that meaning was, was very political and was an interest that me and Tobias and Charlie all had as, as individuals. But what we never said and what we actively voiced against is, this is not a project about what AI thinks about art. Which unfortunately I think and a lot of other people would go, yes, it's about what AI thinks about art, let's sell it, you know. And we were like, no, we need to actively frame this against that because otherwise this is already in 2018, that was already the way that that shit was going. And we're like, we don't want to re-amplify re that narrative because we know what it means. So we really, you know, made a point to not do that with this work. So, um, so this is just, you know, one example of, of why taking control of those tools can do really interesting things for you. If I'd use ImageNet, you know, the famous well-used um, image database, for one thing, that's super racist. I'm not saying that, you know, that there was probably um, very biased, there's definitely gonna be very biased images because every image is biased um, within my data set, but at least in the frame that work that I was using, it, I could, you know, take ownership over that and talk about how I made that and, make, and be uh, responsible for my own decisions. But ImageNet, I didn't make, and if I was using that, then, you know, there's also a lot of images that get cleaned out of that for other ideological reasons that are not my own. You know, particularly nowadays, those sorts of out-of-the-box data sets are often cleaned by people working in tech companies, and tech companies are leaning towards the right wing and particularly climate denial at this point. So you really can't trust anybody, you know, the, the stuff made by those folks. So to, to kind of close off this whole thing, I want to finish by saying that all AI art is art about AI. And by that I mean that whenever you as practitioners out in the world, and I know that some of them, uh, there are some practitioners here in the room, which is always a delight to see, you as practitioners out in the world, if you use AI tools in your work and you in any way frame it, even if you're not falling into the trap of saying the AI did it, the AI is thinking and dreaming, the AI is a poet that's writing poetry with me or whatever, as long as you, if you're not, even if you're not doing those sort of what I would frame as like toxic discourses uh, and instead trying to you know, be more responsible about how you frame those works, if you use the phrase AI or machine learning in any way as a kind of public facing aspect, you know, you're influencing how your audience understand what AI technologies <coughs> are and what they can do. And this is at a time when there's so much hunger for that particular, you know, topic. Um, and, and in which point, you know, you're influencing their ideas of this technology, not just how it's used in art, but kind of as a wider thing. Which means that regardless of what else your artwork is about, it is also about that. So all AI art is art about AI. And I, th I say that just to remind us working in this space of our responsibility that you know, we do impact culture. What we say does matter in these tiny, tiny ways, but it does matter, and you can't say that it doesn't, because that's how culture works. And so you can either say, I'm trying to do my bit to kind of push in the direction of progress that I think is progress, you know, that this is, is genuinely progressive. This leaves behind the stuff that we want to leave behind in the Web 2.0 world, in the world of the repeated history of automation, of like techno-capitalism and the kind of the very the many different forms of old biases and prejudices I've already managed to say in half an hour. Um, you know, we're, we're try, in trying to leave that behind, that is what I think we can start thinking of progress is, and I think we as practitioners have a role to play in that. Thank you. Thanks, hey, thank you very much, Wesley. Um, I think we'll do another like five minute break, and then we're gonna come back for like Q&A.